Welcome to our sharing on the book of Genesis. And in this episode, we want to continue uh, with chapter three. And I want to give you uh, an analysis of what's actually said to us here in chapter three. The author, uh, who is also the storyteller trying to put across something to us very carefully, has gone through a, a detailed dialogue between Eve and the serpent. And you might ask yourself, why is this so? Is it just for the sake of drama? And the answer is no. Uh, you could put a title over this section called How to Sin in One Easy Lesson. And the reason why they uh, give it to you in absolute detail is because they want us to analyze it and to look at it and to learn from it and not to repeat it. That's the whole reason. And so if we learn from this uh, event, then this is a lesson that will carry us through the entire Bible. It is extremely important. So I want to sort of uh, say what it looks like so that you can hear this dialogue, okay? In chapter three and verse one, uh, we're told that a cunning presence that seemed to be wise approached Eve. Now, don't forget this woman has never experienced evil. She has never experienced deception. She has never experienced anything that isn't absolutely good. So she has no idea of what is coming to her. So there's no suspicions aroused. So it seems to be wise. And it questioned Eve as to whether God did really say that there was a prohibition on the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. The reason why this is given to us even like this is that forevermore human beings would be uh, alert if someone says, did God really say? And we're being challenged today very much on this as well. Did God really say he made them male and female when they want to change their gender? So we have to be really, really alert to what's going on here. So to question the veracity of the word of God is extremely important. Now, Eve enters into a dialogue with this person or personage or whatever you want to call him. And the entity is called a serpent. And we'll find out why it's called a serpent later on. Okay. And she begins to dialogue. She should have, at this particular point, turned to God and said, Lord, what is going on? Who is this person? Why is this person questioning your command to us? She doesn't do it. Now, that's the very first lesson we have to learn here. And that is, we won't sin if we turn to God in prayer and ask him for help. It doesn't matter how little you understand, uh, how confused you are, how troubled you are. None of that matters. What matters is that you turn to the Lord and that you ask his help. And when you ask his help, then the confusion is dispersed and you are strengthened and you are helped and you're guided. Eve does none of that. So that's, that's the first big lesson. And we're told then that Eve actually repeated the threat of death for eating from this particular tree. But she didn't know what death was. She had never experienced death. And all she knew was that this was some kind of a response that was going to happen if they actually did the very thing that God considered very unwise to do. And so in verse four, you have the first sign that Eve should have run for her life. And that is that the serpent said, you will not die. There is an absolute contradiction of God's word. So the contradiction of God's word tells you that this entity, whatever it is, however it manifested itself, is certainly not from God. Okay, and then in verse five, he gives false information. Now this is the disinformation or false information or fake news, whatever language you want to put on it, uh, that actually puts people in a very uh, wrong position vis-a-vis -vis God. 
the fake information was that your eyes will be opened. Yes, that's correct. But you will be like God. Oh, no. If you're in disobedience to God, if you're going against God's will, you are not like God. Okay. And he added that you will know good and evil. Yes, they will know good and evil, but it's not going to make them like God. We're going to see the terrible consequences of it. Okay. And then he added more fake news or disinformation. And that is, he says, you will not die. She did die. Adam did die and all their descendants have died. Everyone in their own time we have to face this punishment of death. So if you jump from there down to the Gospel of John, chapter 8 and verse 44, Jesus said that the serpent or Satan or the deceiver or the destroyer or whatever you want to call him, has been a murderer and a liar from the beginning. He never speaks the truth. And so for anyone who wants to be a servant or a friend of God, they have to be absolutely sure that they're dealing with the truth when they're in any kind of a situation. Okay. So as a result of this false information that's given to her, in verse 6, she now turns to contemplate the tree of the knowledge of good and evil for a completely different reason. Before, it was simply a tree that they realized was there and for some reason they were not to touch, okay? And now she realizes that it is pleasant to look at. And she also realizes that this apparently wise entity that is talking to her is telling her that if she participated in this fruit, that she would become wise and she wants to become wise. So she's looking for an intellectual uh, improvement. If she prayed, she would get it directly from God. She wouldn't have to go through this roundabout way to actually get it. And there are philosophies and fake religions out there that will tell you, yes, you can gain wisdom outside of God's will and in contradiction to God's will in your life, that's not true. It's not going to happen. It's not wisdom. Maybe cunning, but it's not wisdom. And so without hesitation, she actually took some of the fruit and ate it. It's her willingness to actually reach out and experiment and do this thing without ever consulting God that has got to warn us alarmingly. The next sentence is even worse. She also gave to her husband and he ate. Now, why didn't Adam question the conversation that was going on between Eve and this apparently cunning thing? Why didn't he question her touching the tree of the knowledge of good and evil? Why didn't he remind her that God had prohibited them from touching this tree? Why didn't he remind her that there was a prohibition called death, which they didn't understand. He didn't do any of that. He's completely passive. And he allowed Eve to make the decision and to involve him. Now, the problem with him is that he was constituted Lord of the earth. He has all the responsibility, not her. And so when we come to the consequences, you realize the Lord is going to pick this up. Okay. So I want you to notice the uh, sequence of events. She listened to the tempter. She heeded the voice of the tempter. And she did not listen for the voice of God. Problem. She allowed Satan to challenge God's word. And she even added to it herself which is absolutely amazing. She even added to uh, what God had said because she said that God had told them, you shall not eat of it and neither shall you even touch it. Well, God didn't say that. God didn't use the words, you shall not touch it. And so we have a warning here that the prophets are going to pick up and all the sages are going to pick up for time immemorial afterwards. And that is, do not add or subtract 
anything to God's word. And this became so important for the chosen people that they passed this Bible on to us without adding a jot or a tittle. And that is these tiny little marks that indicate how to pronounce a word. They even passed on scribal errors to us because they would not add or subtract from the Word of God. And that's why the Word of God has come down to us uh, so pristine and uh, so reliable. But it comes from here. You may not add to God's Word. Listen to this from the book of Proverbs, chapter 30, verse 6. Do not add to his words, lest he rebuke you and you will be found to be a liar because they're not God's words you are giving. They are your own. So if you go down through history since that point, you'll find that those who rebel against God's word and God's law are the very ones who want to change it and who want to deny it outright. For example, governments around the world today have said, of course you can divorce when God says you can't. Of course you can kill when God says you can't kill. You can kill infants and you can uh, kill old people with euthanasia, just to give you an example. And so they attack the, the word of God that was given to us from Sinai, saying you may do what God says you may not do. It's a sure sign of humanity in rebellion against God. And I point this out because Many people reading this dialogue would just continue reading it and not really analyze what was there or what are the consequences of this, which are extremely important. What you need to realize is that once humanity changes God's word, or as we've done in modern times, abrogates God's word, then it means that instead of living by the high standard that God has given to us so that we can live in union with him, we live according to the very low standards of our low nature. And morality goes right down into the pits and therefore we destroy each other. So, as I said a moment ago, Adam, who was the Lord of the earth, didn't question any of this. He just remained uh, completely passive, which is going to be a huge problem for him later on. The result of this is that God's holy will was disobeyed, God's holy word was rejected, and God's holy way, the way of the tree of life, was also uh, deserted and it was just pushed aside. So this is given to us in detail uh, because the authors of the book of Genesis are trying to tell us that this is the only adequate explanation for the present evil that's actually in the world. A world that was created by a loving, holy, and perfectly good God. And a God who wanted humanity to live in a flourishing earth, which was all good, and that everything was there for us. Why would the whole thing go sour? And so we needed this explanation. So you'll read in Romans 5, 12, that sin entered the world by one man. And that one man is Adam, not Eve. And death came by sin. So death came over all because afterwards all have sinned. So there are disastrous consequences to this. And so we have to realize that we have free will, but it has to be used correctly. And the thing that we're going to discover now is that God considers us responsible for what we do, and that if we are free to make a decision, you are also accountable for the decision you have taken. So I want to consider now the consequences of the fall, and we start in verse 7. Then the eyes of both of them were opened and they knew that they were naked and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves coverings. And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. And then the Lord God called to Adam and said, where are you? And he said, 
I heard your voice in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. Uh, this man has been living in very close union with God up to this point. He has never had clothes on his physical body before. It has never been a problem because he was clothed in grace and in innocence. So the very fact that he said, I hid because I was naked, tells God that he has sinned. God knows it anyway, but it's just that the way it is actually expressed, okay. And so in verse 11, God said, who told you you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree of which I command that you should not eat? Then the man said, it was the woman you gave me. I'll stop there for a minute. Okay, so here we have the very first response uh, to the fall. There, so eyes opened, nakedness covering, and then they hide from God. So first of all, as soon as their eyes were opened, now Satan had told them they would become like God. But the exact opposite happened. Shame was born in them. This was something they had never experienced before. And in an instant, they realized that complete disaster had happened. And that disaster is expressed in the one word, naked. So we have to look at the fact that in the Bible, clothing and nakedness is not what you presume, okay? It is sin that removes the garment of grace from us and leaves us naked before ourselves and our weaknesses and before the weaknesses of other people. And it leaves us naked without divine life and therefore without our union with God. The union with God is actually broken. And this nakedness or the lack of the garment of grace uh, exposes us to more attacks from the enemy because the castle of your soul has been breached and he has a way in. And the offense of indecency has been born. This is an awful lot to find out in a couple of seconds. This was the instantaneous reaction. Did they get more knowledge? Yes. Was it good? No. So, I want you to notice now, because of shame and the, the experience of uh, indecency has been born, not only can they not look at God, they can't look at each other. There are huge consequences. And they definitely can't look at God because they realize instantly that their relationship with God is broken. Now, if you go from here down to the gospel, you will find, for example, that when Jesus is dealing with the demoniac in Mark uh, chapter five, that after he has healed the demoniac, Jesus actually covers him probably with his own cloak. But the, the significance of the covering after the healing is that he was naked in his sinfulness. And now that Jesus has healed him, he has clothed him in grace. In the book of Revelation, there is a very telling expression in chapter six and verse 16, in which John tells the Christians that when Jesus is about to return, to make sure you're not found without your clothes on. Now, John is not talking about physical clothing on a physical body. John is saying, make sure that you have not lost the garment of grace because it is absolutely essential when you meet the Lord that that garment of grace is on. If the garment of grace isn't on, then you know from the parable in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 22, about the, the wedding and the man arriving without the wedding garment, which is the garment of grace, that you're thrown out. So we're going to watch Adam and Eve being thrown out of the Garden of Eden. They, they, they lose paradise. We can only have the garment of grace on us if we are to actually meet God.
Now, the second thing we have to face, and it's immediate as well, all the, the things that happen are actually immediate. The age of innocence is over and the age of conscience is born. So God switches on an inner guide inside of us to tell us that is good, that is evil, so that we can make informed choices from now on. And that has stayed with the human race ever since. So their blissful, happy state of ignorance of evil is over. And that puts a heavy weight on their shoulders. They realize instantly that they are in a fallen state and all of their descendants after them carry the weight of this knowledge that we are a fallen race. And that knowledge remains to the end of time if we do not turn to the Lord for redemption and for recovery. So I say at this point that conscience is actually switched on and it will forever remind us that this is, this is good and this is not good. And conscience will forever remind us that God's will is telling you to do that. Those who rebel against God are telling you to do that. They are actually contrary. Make your decision. Because if you decide to go the way of doing God's will, you're choosing the tree of life. If you decide to go the other way, you're choosing the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And we're going to see, as soon as we get into chapter four, the consequences of human beings making the different choices. That's why I'm doing this one in detail, uh, because it helps us to actually interpret uh, chapters four, five, and six. Our inner conscience also reminds us that we will be held accountable. And you're going to see a number of judgments of God between now and uh, chapter 11. And we are facing the final judgment of God at the end of our personal lives and at the end of human history as well, when as individuals, groups, nations, and the whole of humanity, we have to answer for our decisions. We were given free will, but we are responsible. And so the judgment of God is that he pronounces on your decision, whether it was wise or foolish. What I want to show you now is another very important response to this decision that Adam and Eve have made, which is utterly disastrous. And that is the harmony that made their living in this area called Eden, that made it literally paradise because they were living in harmony with God. They were living in harmony with each other and they were living in harmony in their own person as well. All that harmony is gone. First of all, the friendship with God is broken. And so that harmony is gone. Uh, they now hide from the one whom they have known and loved from the beginning of their existence. If you hide from someone you know and love, there is something wrong. The very fact of hiding tells you that. And they seem to know instantly that in their sinful condition, they cannot approach an all holy God. And that is knowledge that God gives us in the depths of our being. Nobody has to tell us. Nobody has to tell us. They also hide their nakedness uh, from each other because they are exposed to each other's weaknesses, as I've said. The harmony between man and woman is broken. As soon as God begins to dialogue with them, they begin to blame each other. The harmony is broken. It was the woman you gave me. It was the serpent who did it. And that is a refusal of responsibility for our own decisions and our own actions, okay? And so the consequences are huge and we're only starting. The inner harmony of their own souls is broken as well. Their self-mastery is gone and the passions of the body they will discover will not submit to their mind anymore. That's huge. Concupiscence is born. And that means that the responses 
that are inside of us are not going to be under your control. You'll have to take control. You will have to develop self-mastery. You will have to decide to go into spiritual warfare with yourself and go into self-denial. This is actually very important. The harmony between themselves and the rest of creation is broken as well, because all of creation stays within God's will and in harmony with what God wants. Look at creation thousands of years later. It's still doing what God asked it to do. We still have the spring, we still have the summer, we still have the autumn, we still have the winter. We still have the, the harmony of the seasons. They still give us the flowers and the fruits. They still do what God asked them to do. But humanity has moved away from that into self-will. And so there is a disharmony between uh, the human race and the rest of creation. And this is going to come out very clearly in the judgment that God will give to them. In fact, the earth will become hostile to humanity. It will no longer cooperate with a race that is not in union with God. And finally, death will come, just as God said it would. So it is really, really sad. And what makes it incredibly sad is that this is permanent. And unless each individual a member of the human race decides to come back to God and decides to uh, conquer themselves. We're going to see this dialogue in chapter four when Cain is told, conquer yourself. Unless we do it, then we go down a wrong road, a very wrong road. So at this particular point, a major question has to be asked, how does God deal with human beings who have made wrong decisions? How does God deal with human beings that have sinned against him, that have pushed aside his will and pushed aside his word? Does he automatically reject us? And the answer is no. And what the Bible shows us is that if you watch God's response to everything that we do, uh, you will discover that he reveals himself more and more and more. It is God who goes seeking Adam. Adam doesn't seek God. That is extremely important. Adam hides. He doesn't want to face God. He doesn't want to talk to him because he knows he has done something very wrong. And it is God who seeks Adam. That is very, very important. And he seeks Adam as a concerned father. Where are you? What has happened? Why, why are you like this? All of these are uh, questions of a, a father who's really concerned about his children, okay? And they are listening as they have always listened to the voice of God as the voice of love, because God is love, 1 John 4, 7. And when you see God looking for Adam and Eve, uh, in the garden, you realize why it is written in the book of Proverbs, chapter 8 and verse 31, that God delights to be with the children of men. We, we cannot grasp that God actually loves us and he loves us infinitely. He loves us absolutely. He loves us unconditionally. And we're going to see as we move on in the chapters of Genesis, just how incredibly loving and patient and forgiving and merciful that God is and how he tries to help this child of his on the earth that has now gone in the wrong direction. And you will see this if you look into a family where there's very young children and the children can fall and hurt themselves and they can bump into things and they can injure themselves. And that brings out a loving, a caring response from the parent. The parent is always trying to help that child to get on their feet and to learn and to grow and to improve until they will reach the fullness of maturity. And so the parent is therefore guiding all the time. Well, we're going to see this in God's reaction here. So 
If you jump down to the New Testament, because I, I'm telling you that the old and the new are all one wonderful fabric, and what is uh, the beginning of Revelation here uh, is played out in a very wonderful way uh, in the New Testament. You have one of the most wonderful parables of Jesus in Luke uh, chapter 15, the parable of the prodigal son. Well, that prodigal son represents the whole human race that has gone very far from the father and that has, has misused the inheritance that the father has given to him and how the father searches for the son. And as soon as the son will come back, it doesn't matter what condition he's in, the father embraces him, restores him back to his sonship and clothes him again. That's the important thing, he's reclothed. Because when you get back into relationship with God, you get the clothing of grace given to you. So that journey of uh, broken humanity uh, to come back to God actually begins here in uh, Genesis chapter 3, which, as I said, is so important. The same story is given to us in Luke 15 in the shepherd uh, abandoning the whole flock to find the one sheep that he has lost or the woman who abandons everything to find one single coin that she has lost. And the coin, of course, was part of her, her bridal price or her dowry, so it was extremely important for her. So this call of God is also a call of sorrow. The one thing that the human race has given to God is sorrow. He gave us joy. He gave us life. He gave us an inheritance. He gave us a wonderful earth to live on. He gave us all the gifts that he could possibly put into a creature. He gave us likeness to himself. He gave us lordship as he is lord of the universe. He has given us everything and he wanted those gifts to be eternal. He's given us so much. What have we given him back? Sorrow. We've given him back grief. And we, we need to really look at this because the cycle of love should be that all of this love came from God to us and that we respond to God with love so that the cycle of love is actually complete. Okay, that didn't happen. And so what we gave back to God was actually sorrow. And so it is the broken heart of God saying, what have you done with everything I've given to you? Now, parents know that sorrow as well. It's also the call of justice, uh, because if something has gone wrong, it must be fixed. You can't go on with, without actually fixing it. And so justice is what moves in to actually sort the thing out and to restart again. And so sin has to be dealt with. God is not indifferent to sin. I gave you uh, Habakkuk 1.13 before, and that is that, Lord, you are too holy. You can't look at sin. Sin is what destroys the human race, so God cannot tolerate it. It's like a parent discovering that a child has a major illness. They cannot leave it like that. They must do something about it. They want this child to live and they want this child to reach its fullness, so they must do something about it. That's what justice is. We're inclined to think of justice as God being, you know, angry and just like a, a judge giving us a sentence that you have to go to jail. It's not like that. Sometimes he has to take major action because you have actually created a disaster. Like if a child sets a house on fire, it's a major disaster. The parents have to do something way out of what they would have done before. So it's according to the level of disaster we'll see God's response. So this divine call of love and sorrow and invitation to come back like the father of the prodigal son didn't just happen here in Eden. It started here, but it goes on throughout all the millennia and goes out through all the generations. It goes out to all people absolutely everywhere. It's the same divine call, come back to me. Come back with all your heart. And the prophets pick this up in later times. Okay. So 
it's very important to realize that it wasn't Adam that sought God out. It was God who sought Adam out. It's very important for us when you go down to the gospel, it wasn't the human race on its knees absolutely saying, Lord, come and deliver us. It was God who sent his own divine son to the earth. It was God who came to us. All the time, it's God seeking us, uh, not really us seeking him. And so if you go to Romans chapter 3 and verse 11, Paul quotes Psalm 14 and says, nobody is seeking God. It's God who seeks us. Okay. So as we go on in the Bible, you will find when God tries to solve the problem that the human race has actually created for him, he goes seeking Abraham to try and recover the human race. 400 years later, he goes seeking Moses to try and solve the problem of his people in Egypt. If you go down to the Gospels, it is Jesus who went seeking the 12 apostles to try and restart the human race in redemption as well. It's always the Lord who goes seeking us. And so I personally have a, a title that I give to Adam and Eve, and it's, it's a bit Irish. It's A&E, Accident and Emergency. They have actually put the whole human race into a complete emergency. So just right now, I want to read the rest of the dialogue between God and these sinners, as we can now call them. Okay, so God said, this is beginning from verse 11, chapter 3. Who told you you were naked? Have you eaten of the tree that I commanded you not to eat? Now notice I commanded you, it was God's absolute will that you shouldn't do this. The man said, the woman you gave me, she gave me to eat and I ate. So it's all her problem. And so what does the Lord do? He speaks to the woman and then he's going to take each of the three of them according to their level of responsibility and deal with them. So the Lord said to the woman, what is this that you've done? And the woman said, truthfully, uh, the serpent deceived me and I ate. Now notice at this particular point, she knows it's deception, but it's too late. The action is over. The disaster has happened. The consequences are going to be permanent. And that's the awful thing about deception. It may take you a long time to realize that you have been deceived. So deception is uh, one of the most successful ways of destroying human beings. And so uh, judgment comes to paradise. The Lord God said to the serpent, because you have done this, you are cursed more than all cattle and more than every beast of the field. On your belly you shall go and you shall eat dust all the days of your life. And then one of the most famous texts in the whole Bible is next. Genesis 3.15. And I will put enmity between you and the woman. Notice enmity. This text begins with them being friendly to each other. I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. Now, this is something we're going to have to pick up as we go along and it's going to be extremely important. Who becomes the seed of the serpent and who becomes the seed of the woman. In other words, there are two types of people on earth. Very important. And if you don't get that, you're not going to understand the text as it is actually given to us. I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise your head. Notice the he and you shall bruise his heel. Now, he and his is singular, it's not plural. And to the woman he said, I will greatly multiply your sorrow and your conception. In pain you shall bring forth children. Your desire shall be for your husband, but he will rule it over you. And to Adam he said, because you have heeded the voice of your wife, and have eaten from the tree of which I commanded you that you were not to eat of, 
Cursed is the ground for your sake. In toil you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Both thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you, and you shall eat the herb of the field. In the sweat of your face you shall eat bread, till you return to the ground, for out of it you were taken, for dust you are, and unto dust you shall return. Thank you for listening. Sláin agus bánach déilíf. Goodbye. God bless you. I want to give you a little message from me, and that is that the Word of God is the second great food that God has given to us. The first one is the Eucharist. The second one, the manna from heaven, is the Word of God. And the third one is prayer. But in order to give people the Word of God, a lot of people have to do an enormous amount of work. They have to go into a great deal of research and do a lot of homework. You mightn't realize it. Jesus told his apostles that the laborer was worthy of his hire. And in other words, that they were to feed the people spiritually, but that the people should enable the apostles to be able to do the work. So I want to make a little uh, plea for you on behalf of Shalom World TV to ask you that if the Word of God is really feeding you, if it's giving you life, if it really is what God wanted it to be, and we're trying very hard to do that, that you would respond by enabling them to be able to continue giving you this. Your donation would actually give life to others and enable them to work. And the Lord would reward you and we would be very grateful. Thank you. fulfillment? Discover true happiness. Stay tuned to Shalom World.